Welcome to this test episode of ESO Stories, a new series where I examine quests in The Elder Scrolls Online from a story and lore perspective. I'm not going to be going into how to complete a quest or giving reactions of me playing through the quest or giving you builds to play the game effectively. My goal is to show the world of Tamriel as a living, breathing place full of interesting people. So I'm going to be talking about the cultures and the characters and the places and their histories. Today's quest will be an armager's duty. As we walk down the main road past the canton of Molagmar, we come across a man in some very fancy armor. Be wary, traveler. Pilgrims have been attacked on these roads. Should you encounter violence, don't hesitate to call on us. We're here to protect you. I can handle myself, but what's the cause of these attacks? I hope your confidence is merited. We have our hands full with the dreg in the Ashlanders, so rescues are in short supply. Captain Artesia Naros is at the canton of Molagmar. She can tell you more than I. Safe travels? I'll speak to her. Molagmar is a very small town, or canton, consisting mainly of the Penitent Pilgrim Inn. On the second floor of this inn, we find buoyant armager Captain Naros. If you're passing through, pay attention. I'll say this once. <clears throat> Pilgrims who ignore my warning vanish from the roads by morning. Whether you're from near or far, best keep your arse at Molag Mar. That's an unusual way to issue a warning. I find it best to put official notice in verse. Helps people remember, and reminds them buoyant armagers aren't ordinators. Nobody wants to talk to them, even other ordinators. Now, if I could get someone to tell me who's attacking these pilgrims. You, uh, need someone to look into that? If you're offering. I suspect Ashlanders are behind the disappearances, but I don't have the numbers to chase them off. If you can sneak into their camp near Molag Mar and find me proof of their involvement, I could finally get some reinforcements. I'll see what I can find. Avoid killing the Ashlanders unless they give you no choice. I don't need you starting a blood feud with my forces split. Now. I must be off to hold the heroic line at a deeply fishy mine. Such is the life of a buoyant armager. Why do you suspect the Ashlanders are responsible? As a rule, they don't like us. So when our people start disappearing, not long after an Ashlander tribe set up camp near Molag Mar, I wager it's more than a coincidence. What's the trouble at this mine you're headed to? Just a dreg infestation. We have them contained. They're an untimely distraction, but nothing we can't handle. Once the dreg finish mating, we'll clear them out while they're still sluggish. Shouldn't be more than a week. You're a buoyant armager? The Vex finest. Fleet and fit. Besting heretic by sword. An ordinator by wit. Sworn to live a life of noble grace. Except to laugh in danger's face. And sometimes we quammer wrangle groups of pilgrims. Warrior poets are quite versatile. Well, she seems to be an interesting individual in her pretty armor. While we trek to the Ashlander camp, let's find out a little bit more about the Buoyant Armagers through a book that I found in-game. Buoyant Armagers, Swords of Vivek, by Tarvis, Archcanon of Vivek. Few embody Lord Vivek's spirit of adventure and exploration as proudly as the buoyant armagers. This military order of the Tribunal Temple serves Lord Vivek with dedication and heroic zeal. Oath-bound to emulate the Master of Morrowind's command of the varied arts of personal combat, chivalric courtesy, and subtle verse, these warrior poets stand as the champions of the Temple and Vivek's personal knights-errant. They take on specific missions when available, 
and wander the land in search of adventure when nothing else requires their intervention. The buoyant armagers perform their deeds and noble exploits in the name of Lord Vivec, even while they engage in friendly rivalry with the more solemn ordinators. Most members of this knightly order come from the ranks of House Redoran. The noble ideals and sense of adventure match closely with the virtues of the house, so it's not surprising that Redorans are drawn to Vivec's service. Take, for example, Elena O'Mayan, the proud daughter of a House Redoran counselor. She could have found a place as a high-ranking officer in the Redoran military, or as a Redoran representative to another Ebonheart Pact nation. Instead, her daring and love of complex verse led her to join the buoyant armagers. A favorite of Lord Vivec, and an inspiration to her fellow knights errant, Oman visits the Vivec Palace often, but rarely remains longer than a day or two at a time. Then it is off on another mission, or in search of her own adventure, so that she can add more verses to her ever-expanding ballad of amazing exploits. Knight Oman, fair and pure, came upon some Nixox spore. Of quantity immense and odor intense, such awful could only have come from something extremely hostile. The ballad goes on to describe how Elena Oman encounters her rival and sometimes lover, Ordinator Nislath also on the trail of the monstrous Nixox. The two exchange friendly drabs and engage in body innuendos as they make their way into a desolate canyon after tracking the enraged creature's path of destruction. Ordinator Nislath, with a mighty sword and a weapon to match, was eager to add such a terrible beast to his ever-growing catch. But Knight Oman smoked faster, assaulting the creature with a barrage of banter, confusing, inspiring her wit and words, ended the threat and averted disaster. Vivek encourages his knights errant to hunt down and eliminate necromancers, blighted creatures, and the assorted champions of dark forces throughout the land. He expects them to remain true to Vivek's ideals while quoting from the warrior poet's writings or crafting their own verse as they seek out adventure. Novice members of the order don the traditional chitin armor of the Dunmer, in contrast, more renowned knights adorn themselves with more expensive daedric or even glass armor. Whereas the ordinators stand somber and alert, Vivek's buoyant armagers leap and bound enthusiastically as they search for adventure, gushing with ostentatious bravado and dashing flamboyance. The typical member of the order is valiant, fearless, well-read, and a master of verse and rhythm. They revere Lord Vivek, who, in turn, blesses them with preternatural courage and a flair for dramatic performance. When our Lord Vivek requires agents to complete an important task or deal with an impending threat, he never hesitates to call upon his loyal and faithful buoyant armagers. Once we reach the Ashlander camp, a symbol comes up showing that we are trespassing, which means not only will we be attacked if we're seen, but we will also get a bounty. If you have a bounty, guards in normal towns will stop you and force you to pay off the bounty or be attacked. So sneaking through the camp isn't too difficult. We quickly come upon the first of two pieces of evidence we need to find. And it, it is a note. Another has disappeared on their hunt for the offerings. Four have gone and not returned now. Our offerings are meager and I fear the Daedra Lords show us their displeasure. Why should they show us favor while the slaves of the false gods trample these holy grounds and erect their blasphemous temples? They are intent to drive us from this place and sunder our ancient pact. Dishonored or dead, our warriors cry out to be avenged. We cannot allow this to continue. What path is before us? What shall the bones tell? Do not tempt the Daedra lords with restlessness. Give to them freely as our ancestors did, so that their dire gazes do not fall upon our tribe. It is best to offer the princes their rightful due when the seasons show us their brief favor, lest they call upon us in the lean times. You will know the portents by the fatness of the guar. You will know it by the stench of the sea on the inland. And you will know it by the wanderings of the lost peoples among their false gods' paths. Lead the tribe to great Altmor Balarami, for that is where the ancestors made their pact, 
and so it will be there that the pact is renewed. Upon arrival, a light up higher of grain. It must be fed until the ritual has concluded. There will be no full bellies until the princes have had their fill. Each day, as the sun crests the distant waves, gather the living sacrifice at our ancient altar in Altmer Balarami. Split the throats over the stone with the black glass blade, and invoke the Daedra lords while the blood is still fresh. Spurn not one, or our suffering will be assured and terrible. Spread the sacrificial entrails to the far corners of the altar before the sun reaches its true height, and leave the offering to the prince's mercy. When the host of Namira and touch of Periite have befouled the corpse, you will know the day's feast is concluded. Attendants may remove the offering and wash the altar with the oils of atonement. On the day of longest dusk, Azora signals that our offerings are satisfactory to the Daedra lords. Only then may we break our fast and cease our supplication. Do not tarry on Altmer Balarami, for it is their place. With both pieces of evidence found, our quest changes to examine the ritual site. Luckily, it's not very far. We can quickly climb a ladder, and we find an altar with a fire burning and some sort of creature on the altar. When we examine it, we see blood and entrails are strewn over this stone altar. It is unclear what they belong to, but they are fresh. Something died here very recently. But looking at the skeleton, we can see that is obviously not a human skull. Whatever they used for a sacrifice, it wasn't a person. And apparently we weren't as sneaky as we thought coming up here. Caught in the act! You have much to answer for! Is this why you sneak through our camp? To desecrate our sacred rites? Do the slaves of the false gods fear us so much they won't even face us themselves? Why are you here, Outlander? Answer truthfully and I may only hobble you. The buoyant armagers believe you've been attacking pilgrims on the road. I'm here for proof. Always they blame us for their ills. If they seek our deaths, they should just come for them. These ploys and ambushes are the acts of cowards. Ambushes? Members of your tribe have been attacked as well? Four have vanished since we arrived to find your armagers building their garish shrine over our ancestral lands. I suspect they were made prisoners of the false gods. You deny it? The armagers made clear to me not to attack you, only to look around. They don't want a war. Those who worship the three are devious, but if it's true that they do not seek our destruction, I will not invite it. What will make them leave us be? You've been making blood sacrifices. I need to know the pilgrims weren't among them. Your pilgrims are not here. They litter the wild with their weakness. A beast's meal, nothing more. See for yourself. You will find what's left of their camps here, where I have marked your map. I'll investigate your claims. I will seek my own answers. When you have seen what I have seen, meet me at the Helan Ancestral Tomb. What is it you're looking for? My kin remain missing. I will find them regardless of whether you speak truth or lies. Why meet at Halen Tomb? The burial ground has been disturbed recently. Once you see that we are innocent, we will learn if the truth lies with the dead. The first pilgrim campsite we search is a bit north of the Ashlander camp. Uh, near a small boat that's on the shore. We find uh, what looks like a chunk of meat lying on the ground that's labeled as mutilated remains. When we search it, we find worried bones. Looking at these worried bones in our inventory, the description says, Disfigured bones from the corpse of a recently slain pilgrim. Little flesh still clings to them, and their surface bears countless gouges. So something terrible happened here. 
and there's nothing left of the poor pilgrim but some bones. Hopefully the other two campsites are less terrible and more helpful. To get to the second pilgrim camp, we have to fight a Fletcherfly Golem, which is a bit of a nasty critter. Once we get past, we find the body of a pilgrim and the body of a buoyant harbinger next to a lean-to. The description of the buoyant harbinger says, This buoyant harbinger appears to have died defending the pilgrim laying dead nearby. Her helmet is spattered in a viscous ichor that smells of month-old fish. And we take her helmet as evidence. Looking around the camp, we don't find much of note. There's nothing on the pilgrim. There are a few containers with crafting materials or foodstuffs. Nothing of any real value. At the, at the third pilgrim camp, we find a skeleton lying on the ground. And next to it is the journal of a pilgrim. Today I begin my pilgrimage to Molag Mar. I'm eager to see this new temple for myself. I hear they built it on the water. Perhaps it floats. Once one has glimpsed Bar Dao, the idea hardly seems far-fetched. The buoyant armagers are a sight to see. Their numbers patrol many of the paths of pilgrimage, and they always seem to have something of a spring in their step. Their songs and swords are a comfort for any otherwise inhospitable road. It doesn't float, but that doesn't make Molog Mar any less marvelous. This will be a wonderful place to recuperate and prepare for the journey to Mount Kond. But first, I must offer my devotions to the three at the temple. I've seen fewer of the buoyant armagers around the last day or so. Gone off to mind the roads, I suppose. When I asked their senior here when I might find an escort on my journey, she frowned. Some incident at the glass mine has them busy. She claims no one can be spared. I've waited long enough. The armagers may be busy, but I'm sure their presence here has made the wilderness a little tamer. Tomorrow morning I'll continue my journey. But from the skeleton on the ground, we can see that he never continued his journey. In fact, he never left this lean-to. So there's not much else of note here. There's another skeleton inside the lean-to, and a water skin with a little bit of water for alchemy. A little bit of crafting material, nothing particularly handy or valuable. So now it's off to talk to Ebal and see what he came up with. Now that we've examined all three of the pilgrim campsites, we need to meet Ebal at the Helon Ancestral Tomb and see what he found out. You have investigated the camps. Do you still believe? No. Whatever killed these people tore them apart like a ravenous beast. The work of carrion animals, I thought. Now I'm not so sure. When I found the bloody tracks leading to this tomb, I heard wailing within. If one of your pilgrims disturbed... You didn't investigate further? I will not invade an ancestor tomb. No Ashlander would be welcome in such a place. They are as unclean and treacherous as the three. You may test if the trespass of Outlander feet is of less offense, but I will remain here. I'll let you know what I find. As we search the Helon Ancestral Tomb, we're going to find a lot of urns. Now, urns and tombs are a great place to get materials. They're a great place to find crafting motifs, which are very rare, but you find them in urns. You can find cooking recipes, lots of cooking recipes, and the plans to build things to put inside your in-game house. They're a great place to get these resources, so we're going to be opening every single one of them. While we go through the urns, we'll learn a little bit about what the Tribunal Dunmer think about the Ashlanders. And we'll do this through an in-game book.
Ashlander Tribes and Customs by Ulan Raleth of House Redoran. The Dunmeri nomads, known as the Ashlanders, wander Morrowind's wilderness, going where they will and doing what they please. Free of the strictures that both provide structure and a high degree of rigidity for the great houses, they organize in loose tribes and hearken back to an earlier time in Dark Elf history. They subsist as herder-hunters and find simple pleasures in a more natural lifestyle. Ashlanders revere their ancestors and worship Daedra, refusing to acknowledge the divinity of the living gods of the tribunal. They occasionally trade with other tribes and even with the great houses, exchanging guar hides and shalk resin for news of the wider world and goods they can't easily acquire in the wild. Within their nomadic society, the Ashlanders are courteous, proper, and polite. When dealing with outsiders, though, they can become easily offended. Tribal leaders, called Ashkons, serve as the warrior protector of the community they lead. Second in command is the Gulakon, who serves as the voice of the tribe in matters of trade and negotiations. Outsiders will do well to approach the Gulakon first before attempting to seek an audience with the Ashkon. Each tribe also has a wise woman, a far seer who keeps the songs, lore, and prophecy of the tribe. She is the spiritual leader of the tribe. The rest of the tribe stands as equals, sharing responsibilities as they hunt, herd, forage, and otherwise support each other. The nomads are organized into four primary tribes. The Emuza tribe resides in the southern coastal regions and swamplands of Vardenfell. In years past, they traveled from coast to coast, fishing and hunting, but more recently have largely been pushed out into the bitter coast region as Telvani and Redoran settlements spring up around their former grounds. The Emusa are among the most peaceful of Ashlander tribes, and the weakest in terms of amassing any sort of a warband. They wear light clothing, often adorned with small shells, scales, and even netting. Their weapons are more like tools, simple knives and spears they can use to work as well as defend themselves if need be. They prefer to keep to themselves and be left alone, living out their lives hunting, herding, and especially fishing. They have a small, semi-permanent settlement currently along the Bitter Coast, where they live off the fish and other local wildlife in the swamplands. The Arabenumson tribe resides in the Molog Amor region of Ardenfell, and are as dour and dangerous as the volcanic ashlands they hail from. The Arabenumson are quite war-loving. They are seen as greedy and cruel by their fellow Ashlanders, and are believed to not have respect for many Ashlander customs. They care little about prophecy, history, and lore, so the wise woman has little power in this tribe. Arabenumson are also typically the most heavily armed and armored. They are warriors first and foremost, valuing strength above all else. The Urishalaku tribe is the most highly respected tribe and the second most populous. They reside in the West Gash region and the Northern Ashlands, which, like the Grayslands, is considered prime hunting and foraging land. But more than its many hunters, warriors, and herders, Urishilaku is famed for its lore keepers. It is the only tribe that currently has multiple farseers, and the wise woman of Urishilaku is widely renowned. Urishilaku has been key in ushering in a temporary age of peace among the Ashlander tribes, for all are listening when the oracles speak of an age of coming strife that the tribes must prepare for. In particular, it is the Urishilaku tribe that keeps faith that Nerevar Incarnate will return soon to unite the people. Urishilaku are some of the only Ashlanders to occasionally use magic. More common than actual spell weaving is enchanting and alchemy, at which they are highly skilled. They are also the tribe most interested in ancient relics, scrolls, and other items one might find in the ruins dotting Vardenfell. Bringing them such things is one way to gain favor with this tribe. The most populous tribe, the proud and confident Zainab, resides in the fertile Grayslands region of northeast Vardenfell. Like the Amanusa, 
They are surprisingly peaceable and friendly even to outsiders, although they are somewhat greedy and arrogant as well. Zainab is, in a way, the oddest of the tribes in that they follow the old ways, but they are extremely interested in the change that has overtaken Vardenfell. They freely trade with the great houses, and some have even sought to forge more firm business deals with houses like Halalu. All in all, one gets the impression that Zainab is the most willing to adapt, even if they will not entirely leave their Ashlander lifestyle behind. Zainab possesses the most diverse collection of goods, including their arms and armor. They typically trade for goods instead of crafting them, and they are well known for harvesting, foraging, and mining in the rich grazelands, which has led to their unrivaled prosperity. Once we're done searching all the urns, we'll head a little bit further into the tomb, and find out that the noises were coming from a pilgrim who is hiding in here, named Baron Malloran. And we'll see what he has to say. Don't hurt me, please! Calm down, I'm here to help. You weren't followed, were you? The ruddy man hunts us. It lives again. It attacked our camp last night, tore poor Ilva's head off, right in front of me. I ran as fast as I could, and I hid in here. Ruddy man? What is that? The spawn of Vivek and Molag Baal? The dread hunter wearing the ancient carapace? Have you read nothing of the sermons? It devoured all it saw until Vivek cast it down twice over. But it lives again. You have to believe me. Do you know where I can find this ruddy man now? I... no. When I saw it, I ran and never looked back. Wait. It lunged from the rocks above. The glass mine! We were near the glass mine when it descended on us. Follow me. I'll lead you out of here. Safely. Watch for traps. I hoped they'd kill it, not us. And he's right to warn us about traps. Apparently during my searching of urns, I managed to accidentally avoid rather a lot of traps on the way in here. On the way out? Not doing such a good job of avoiding them. In fact, hitting everyone sometimes more than once. In hindsight, the wailing was too pathetic to have been the angry dead. What did your sniveling pilgrim have to say for himself? He said he was attacked by something called the Ruddy Man. Only a fool would believe that. The mad gibberings of a scared scrib. We cannot go chasing myths. Did the weakling provide us nothing of value? He said the monster came upon them from atop the nearby glass mine. What you call glass mine, we know as an ancient dreg spawning grounds. The slaves of the false gods have disturbed these beasts. Now we all pay the price. That remains to be seen. Regardless, something is getting in and out of the mine despite the guards. Then we will see where this path takes us. The tracks that brought me here will surely lead us to our quarry. Let's go. The glass mine is not far. Lead on. There are many tracks here. Look, above! Why does it hesitate? Do we scare you, ruddy man? It flees! It wants no part of prey that can wound it. Was that the creature the pilgrims fear? This ruddy man of legend? It is skulking vermin inflated by the lies of a false god, nothing more. That looked like no dreg I've ever seen. Dreg are not usually cunning, this much is true. Now that it knows we hunt it, this creature may wait us out in its lair. With what we know, we might convince the armagers to clear out the mine sooner than planned. They will not trust the word of an Ashlander, and we know the creature easily eludes them. You must hunt it. Why me? Who else, Outlander? The slaves of the false gods will never allow me to trespass their domain, and the task is beyond them. This falls to you, or no one. Very well. I'll find and kill this thing, ruddy man or not. 
If this creature is of the dreg, it may share their weaknesses. I will consult our wise women. They may know something that will aid you in this hunt. Convince the pawns of the three of what you have found. I will meet you at the mine's entrance. Do the Ashlanders have any legends of the ready man? It is an invention of the three. A fable of great deeds to serve the vanity of a false god. To see it is to know they speak no truths. Moving around the hill to the mine entrance, we find the well-dressed Captain Naros, having just dispatched a few drag, and see what she has to say. That looks to be the last of them. For now. I was beginning to think the Ashlanders got you as well. Were you able to find evidence that they've been preying on the pilgrims? I can't spare a moment from these dreg as it is. It's not the Ashlanders. A cunning dreg is killing your pilgrims. They call it the ruddy man. Is that your idea of a sick joke? We have more sense of humor than the ordinators, Outlander, but blasphemy is a line you best not cross. The ruddy man is an evil dealt with long ago by Vivek himself. Where did you even get such an idea? A lone survivor. I've seen the creature, and so did one of yours. One of... gods? That's a smell for the ages. So this is what became of Sidra. I hope she gave a good account of herself. Suppose I entertain this theory. What am I supposed to tell the temple? Send Lord Vivek? All I know is that it's hiding in the glass mine, and I'm gonna kill it. And understand this. Whatever you find down there, it isn't the ruddy man. Vivek killed the ruddy man. There are still miners unaccounted for. Do what you can for anyone still alive down there. Vivek guide you to great glories. Thank you. What now? An Ashlander? Keep your distance, understand? Peace, armagers. I must speak with the Outlander. That is all. If you wish to hear him out, I'll permit it. But don't let your guard down. The wise women cannot say if your quarry is what you think, but they have shared their knowledge of dreg with me. They offer a mixture to lure the creature out. Spill this in the ruddy man's den, and it will show itself. Just like that, the monster will face me? It works on the dreg. That is all I can say. Be wary in its lair. If that thing took my kin, then it is more dangerous than it leads on. Understood. You have proven yourself capable for an outlander. Avenge our lost warriors. What can you tell me about hunting dreg? Trust the wise women's mixture. Dreg crave a dark, dank place from which to snatch unsuspecting prey. Drive them from this safety, and they are no danger to skilled warriors. Entering the mine, we need to find some trapped miners, and also locate the ruddy man and eliminate it. In order to do this, we need to take a fairly circuitous route around the outside of the mine, going in a spiral towards the center. During that time, we can learn a little bit more about the living gods of the tribunal of Vardenfell. We can do this through the eyes or the reports of Rigert the Brash of the Nord Cultural Exchange. Dear Thane Vigli Stormbreast, Honored leader of the Nord Cultural Exchange, it is I, Rigert the Brash, writing to you in Windhelm as you requested. I continue my study and exchange of information with the little dark elves of Morrowind, as you ordered. Why you sent Rigert away after he only just arrived, I don't completely understand but I suppose my mission is very important. As I set foot, well, both feet really, into Vardenfell, the thought of this mission makes Rigert so excited. Trading culture with allied nations so that we can learn more about each other is almost better than cold mead on a hot day. Almost. This time I travel to learn more about the Tribunal, the so-called living gods of the Dark Elf people. The wonderment of it all gives Ridgert the skin bumps. Now, unlike our good and proper gods of Skyrim, gods who listen to our prayers but have the good graces to stay out of Nord business, 
the Dark Elf Gods actually walk among the people and rule over them the way the Scald King parades around Windhelm. No offense, Scald King. The God Kings of Morrowind seem to answer to various titles, although the most common appellations appear to be Lord, Mother, and Wizard. Rigert spent many long hours attempting to converse with knowledgeable little Dark Elves, but much of what they told me just made my head go spinny-spin. Here's what I learned about the Tribunal Gods. Maybe you can make better sense of it all. The most popular of the three, at least in Vardenfell, is the warrior poet Vivek. They sing his praises in the corner clubs and shout his victories from the rooftops. Really, the faithful on every street corner eagerly showed pamphlets containing his lessons and sermons at me if I so much as smiled in their general direction. Lord Vivek is called the Master of Morrowind. I tried to read some of his poetry, but it just made my eyes hurt. Not at all as interesting or body as the great Fiaki, and full of illusions that any who aren't drenched in dark elf culture just wouldn't understand. Truth be told, even I, dark elf expert that I am, had trouble with some of the more esoteric concepts. He preaches duty to faith, family, masters, and all that is good. He saved his people on numerous occasions, including helping to repel at least two Akavari invasions. Most recently, the invasion that led to the creation of our cherished Ebonheart Pact. He apparently has some sort of connection to the Daedra and the Fala, who the Dark Elves call one of the Good Daedra. He does have a dark side, though, as I've been told that he has an unnatural attraction to lustful thoughts and murderous intentions. So, not very different from the rest of the puny Dark Elves, right? He lives right here in a grand palace in Vivek City, which conveniently has the same name that he does. I spent a few minutes in his presence, but I couldn't help but stare at his strange appearance. Also, he tended to float around the chamber. As a tactic to make us mortal creatures feel inferior, it worked surprisingly well. Still, I was happy to have been able to spend some quality time with such a personage of impressiveness. Next, I tried to discover everything I could about one they call Mother Morrowind, Alamalexia. Now, it turns out she mostly inhabits the temple in Mournhold, so I wasn't able to get a face-to-face -face with the Dark Elf patron of healers and teachers. I admit I'm very disappointed, as I am given to understand that for a goddess, she's the Elk's antlers. They also claim that she embodies the best of Dark Elf culture and determination, which would fit into my area of expertise quite nicely. One priest told me that she protects the poor and the weak, and that her wisdom guides the Dunmeri through all their affairs. A drunk dark elf in a corner club also mentioned that she was kind of a stick in the mud. But an ordinator dragged her away before I could ask what she meant by that. Oh well. The most mysterious of the three god monarchs is Sotha Sil, also known as the Mystery of Morrowind and the Wizard of Wondrishness. I believe that's what the priest called him. I misplaced those notes and am writing this last bit from memory while having a few mugs of mead. Although rumors abound, no one that I could find has claimed to have seen Sothasil in a Horker's age. The best I could learn from asking around is that Sothasil is the patron of artificers as mages, and many, especially Dark Elves, consider him to be the most powerful Magicka user in all the land. I even heard an amazing tale about a city of clockwork gears that Sorthasil crafted to study the inner workings of the world, and they claim it's only as big as a small mammoth. Now that's something I'd give my last rabbit meatball to see. He's also credited with negotiating some kind of compact with a number of Daedric princes, but I decided not to look too deeply into this rumor. As Fiaki says, the fool who stares gets noticed by the Daedra. Riggert is not so foolish as to do something as stupid as that. Did you roll your eyes, Thane Vigley? I bet you rolled your eyes. The three living gods of Dun Mary empower the Tribunal Temple and embody the will and discipline of Dark Elves everywhere. Well, except for the Ashlanders, who refuse to bend their knees to Vivek, Alamexia, or Sothasil. Some sort of family squabble, I imagine. I'll look into that while I'm here. Rigret the Brash, Ambassador at Large for the Nord Cultural Exchange.
Once you reach the center of the mine, there's a large open area surrounded by crates and boxes and various garbage. And in the center, there's a pile of debris that when you look at it, gives you the option to use the wise woman's potion. When you use the potion, the ruddy brood mother bursts forth and you've got a fight on your hands. She's not too terribly difficult. She has two fairly strong attacks. The first is a cone in front of her where she slashes with her talons. The second is a 360 degree area electrical attack. So just keep circling around her to avoid the cone. And when the 360 degree indicator goes out, just run away until it goes off and then charge back in. She should go down fairly quickly. Once we've looted the Broodmother and any of the various crates and boxes that are lying around, we can exit by crossing the wooden bridge towards where we came in. If you haven't gotten it, there's a prisoner encased in mud along here. And it gives us a quick way out without having to go all the way around the big spiral. Once we leave, we find Captain Naros and Ibal waiting for us outside. That's it then? You've dealt with whatever was attacking our pilgrims? No one has anything to fear from that creature ever again. When I accepted your offer of assistance, I didn't expect you to be this thorough. Your bravery in descending into that drag-infested mine alone and slaying whatever it was that was killing the pilgrims is commendable. What do you think it was, if not the ruddy man? The ruddy man from the sermons took the act of a god to fell. So forgive me if I don't seem convinced your beast was him. No one knows where the original carapace came from. Perhaps there were other, lesser objects cut from the same cloth. You're suggesting this could happen not again? Not a pleasing thought, but it's an explanation I can accept. We can only hope the world never sees the like of the true ruddy man again. It's gone for now, and we've avoided a feud with the Ashlanders. So let's try to look on the bright side. Your stench is proof enough of your deeds. Was this ruddy man a worthy foe? I'm not sure what it was, but it didn't die without a fight. You have my respect, Outlander. Our fallen warriors are avenged. Tell your armagers that we will soon depart. May we never cross paths again. Where will you go now, Ibal? Home. The ritual of sacrifice is almost complete, and the Daedra lords you so foolishly ignore will, we hope, spare us their wrath for another decade. We will hope they turn their dire gaze upon Molog Mar before we return again. And with that, we complete the quest. And we gain the Tribal Helm of the Defiler, which is a fairly nice medium helmet. I happen to use medium armor, so that's really nice. And that ends the quest in Armager's Duty. So thank you for watching this first test episode of ESO Stories. Maybe I'll make some more of these. The amount of work that went into this, it's not going to be something that comes out weekly. I may be able to do one a month. So, thank you for watching. Please keep an eye out if I decide to make any more. I'll let you know in the comments if I start working on another one. And have a good one.